Uh, it's really, really wonderful to be here tonight, and I uh, extend a great thank you to the folks at JBGI for giving me the opportunity to, to speak with you all about our research. Uh, the title of my talk is, is uh, quite uh, expansive, so linking uncultivated microbes to biogeochemical processes. Uh, in the course of the talk, I'm really going to focus mostly on one process, and that is organisms that make a living oxidizing methane um, coupled to sulfate uh, reduction. And this general theme of linking microorganisms uh, to biogeochemical processes is really a unifying um, theme for microbial ecology itself. So how do we begin to get information about the diversity of microorganisms that exist in environmental systems and actually link that to their specific functions, interactions, and how that ties into global geochemical cycles. And really we've made incredible strides in trying to understand the diversity of organisms that we see in the environments, and we're really now starting to forge some connections uh, to their specific functions through a variety of, of different approaches. And so it's a really an exciting time to, to be in the field and uh, to be bringing together some of the molecular tools and, and geochemical uh, techniques. And so in my lab, the way that we've been approaching this is, is really sort of a systems biology or an ecosystems biology approach where we take uh, tools related to uh, stable isotope probing, uh, geochemical techniques, um, and other types of activity-based tracers, combine it with what we can learn through environmental omics methods, and then also incorporate microscopy so we can actually see the organisms themselves and try to understand their function and spatial uh, structure in the environment. And really, this, this combination of tools in order to really get a sense of the ecosystem needs to be applied across a variety of different scales, going from the cell or subcellular level all the way up to sort of tens of meters or even kilometers ecosystem scale. And so the group has been building these, these types of approaches, and I'm going to give you some examples of how we've been using this uh, in our research looking at methane cycling in the environment. So just to give you an overview of the talk, I'm going to start off by, by sharing some of the assays that we've been using to look at activities of microorganisms uh, in environmental systems, namely uh, two techniques, one called BondCat, the other um, fish nanosims, and then uh, talk about how we can leverage these types of tools combined with various omics um, techniques to learn more about the, the entire ecosystem, and then finally, uh, get into the application of, of how we've applied these things to look at the ecophysiology and interactions of organisms tied to methane cycling uh, in anaerobic environments uh, associated with methane. So one of the techniques uh, that we've been trying to develop in the group uh, is to look at activity of microorganisms through their translational um, activity. And this is uh, a technique uh, called BondCat, which is bioorthogonal, non-canonical amino acid tagging. And essentially, this was a method that was developed by a colleague of mine um, at Caltech and was applied to look at the translational activity of model organisms. And what we tried to do um, in collaboration with uh, my postdoc, Roland Hattenpickler, and folks in, in Dave's lab was to see if we could take BondCat and apply it in natural environmental systems to look at which microorganisms were actively expressing proteins uh, in situ. And so the way that the BondCat technique works is essentially you, you add, you incubate your sample with a surrogate. This is a, a non-canonical amino acid, either um, that's a, a surrogate for methionine, so either uh, azetohomoalanine or HPG. Um, in the, these, uh, the sort of native translational machinery of the cell will incorporate these uh, artificial amino acids into the newly synthesized protein chain, and then we can, after the fact, um, tag those labeled um, amino acids uh, through copper catalyzed click chemistry. So it's an azide alkyne or alkyne azide reaction. Uh, in the presence of copper, this forms a stable uh, uh, ring structure, and then with a fluorophore attached, you can visualize the newly synthesized proteins um, in the cell. And so we've been using this type of approach as sort of a fast uh, 
quick way of surveying which organisms are active, antibiotically active uh, in situ. The other approach that gives you a little bit more specificity in tracking substrates is to use um, stable isotope labeling. And so we've been combining this with fluorescence in situ hybridization to get a sense of which organisms have assimilated different either carbon, nitrogen, or sulfur, or even hydrogen compounds um, in the environment. And so instead of incubating now with an amino acid, we're incubating with an isotopically labeled substrate. So here we're using 15N as an example. Uh, those cells that are capable of metabolizing that substrate will take it up into their biomass. And then we can combine this with fluorescence in situ hybridization and analyze uh, specific cells using secondary ion mass spectrometry. And this gives us information not only of the organisms that have actively taken up the substrate, but actually how active they were, so how much of that substrate was incorporated in situ. So this is more of a quantitative type of approach for looking at uh, the flow of carbon or nitrogen through microbial uh, communities. And so we've been applying these two approaches to investigate sort of a long-standing love of mine, and that is uh, the syntrophic association between anaerobic methane oxidizing archaea and sulfate-reducing uh, bacteria. And this process of sulfate-coupled methane oxidation is really globally um, important in the overall methane cycle. In fact, over 80% of the, the methane that's fluxing out of deep marine sediments is consumed through this process um, uh, by these centrifugal consortia, consortia that live uh, in anoxic marine sediments. And so if we go to a place on the seafloor where methane is advecting um, to the seabed, we can find uh, these multicellular consortia of archaea that are shown in red and sulfate-reducing bacteria uh, shown in green here. And they tend to thrive in the gradient between where that methane is fluxing from below and where sulfate is diffusing in from above in zones where, where oxygen is not, not penetrating. And so we have these great natural laboratories. We can go down and collect these samples in situ and then study the microbial uh, associations between the archaea and the bacteria. Now, even before we identified these methane oxidizing archaea, which is almost two decades ago now, um, people had hypothesized that this syntrophic association existed just from looking at the geochemical profiles of methane and sulfate. And so what they believed was going on was that there were methanogens that, in the presence of a syntrophic sulfate reducer, could reverse their metabolism, basically, instead of producing methane, oxidize that methane if there was an organism that could scavenge those reducing equivalents, in this case, hydrogen, uh, through a syntrophic uh, partnership. Now, we got some insight into the organisms involved in this process through early molecular tools. And this was done when I was a student in Ed DeLong's lab long ago. And in this case, they were applying just 16S ribosomal RNA surveys in combination with lipid biomarker analysis. And what they found was that you, there were groups of these uncultured archaea that were related to methanogens but distinct from any known cultured organisms uh, that were dominant in these environments where there was methane seepage. And in tandem, there was also these archaeal lipid biomarkers that were very depleted in carbon-13. So it suggested the organisms that made those biomarkers had consumed methane. And so this sort of started the whole field off. We now know there's quite a, amount, a bit of diversity of these methane oxidizing uh, communities. Also, when we started, it used to be when you said AOM or anaerobic methane oxidation, that was synonymous with sulfate-coupled methane oxidation. But we now know that there are methane oxidizing archaea that can gain energy through coupling with a variety of different terminal electron acceptors. So there's examples of nitrate-coupled methane oxidation and now even iron-coupled methane oxidation, all, all with relatives of these methane oxidizing archaea. So for my work, we're going to focus on the sulfate-methane couple here. And if you see on this sort of uh, redox gradient, there's not a lot of free energy that these organisms get out of this process. They grow incredibly slowly uh, in the environment. 
And even just focused on those that are coupled to sulfate reduction, we see a tremendous amount of diversity, both in uh, the types of archaea, the types of sulfate-reducing partners that form associations, as well as the structural associations that you see, all coexisting within the same sample. So there's, there's a lot to be sort of unpacked in these environments, which has uh, sort of been great bread and butter projects for, for the lab group um, over the years. Okay, so we see all of this tremendous diversity in the environment. The general assumption is that they all are doing this, this process of oxidizing methane with an A electron transfer to the sulfate reducing bacteria, which then is converting sulfate into hydrogen sulfide, right? But is that a, a sound assumption? You know, or are they all doing the same thing? And how are we sustaining this tremendous diversity um, in situ? So we have a number of different questions that we're trying to ask of these um, environments. So, and I'm going to go through uh, a few of these in the talk today. So we're interested in understanding what is the um, breadth of genomic and ecological diversity found in these environments. Is there evidence of niche diversification? So what sustains this tremendous diversity that we see in situ? And how is this syntrophic association working? So, so how are these organisms uh, conserving energy through this general process of sulfate-coupled methane oxidation? And so to, to be able to answer these questions really requires this combination of molecular and isotopic uh, and geochemical techniques. Okay, so let's start with uh, what we've learned in terms of the genomic uh, and ecological diversity of these organisms. So like I think all of us in the room, we've probably all tried to use some form of, of omics techniques in one way or another to understand um, our ecosystem. And for those who work in sediments and soils, you probably also know that this is an incredibly frustrating um, process at times because the, the, the inherent complexity of these ecosystems. And these are this is complexity not only in, in the substrates themselves, but also in the amount of strain level heterogeneity that you see um, often in, in soils and sediments, which really um, does a job on, on assembly capabilities. So, so even though our methane oxidizing communities are some of the, among the most dominant organisms in the ecosystems. When we try to reassemble genome bins, oftentimes they fail miserably. And we think that has to do with the, the level of strain level heterogeneity that's existing in this environment. And just to give you an example, so if we do a sort of a metatranscriptomic analysis, even in a single sample, we're seeing 88 different types of MCRA genes that are being expressed simultaneously um, on the protein level same level of, of diversity. And so there's a lot going on um, all across a very small amount of, of um, sediment material. So we decided um, to try a different approach. Um, and instead of trying to deconvolve computationally the diversity in the environment, try to actually physically separate out these organisms before um, sequencing. And so we had the great fortune of, of working with uh, Tanya Voika and Rex Malmstrom and, and their group with a single cell uh, pipeline. And the idea was that we would try to use this BondCat technique combined with their flow sorting single cell pipeline to, to separate out individual aggregates and get information about um, the, the membership and the genomes of these organisms. And so we did this initially through a director's discretionary fund and now um, through FICUS funding um, with, with the JGI. And so Roland um, kicked this off here. And again, we were able to use BondCat to label these very slow growing methane oxidizing consortia, even after a very small amount of time. Um, and in combination with um, the group at the JGI, we were able to show that you could um, successfully separate, see and separate these BondCat uh, positive aggregates uh, out, of, out of these sediment um, communities. So this is the negative control here. All of these green spots here represent aggregates that we were able to then sort. And so the initial uh, pass was quite surprising, actually. Um, so we were successfully able to, to recover genetic material from most of these um, consortia. And what was 
tremendously interesting to me was the fact that we recovered almost the full breadth of diversity known across all of the ANMI groups that had been described to date, all ex existing, all active in the same sample. And so if we look at this, this full um, swath of diversity here, the only group we didn't recover was this ANMI 3 group. The rest of them all were BONCAT active, so translationally active in the same bottle, <laughs> all at the same time we were able to sort them out. Now the other nice thing about this approach was that because we're sorting intact aggregates, we also get information about the coexisting uh, bacteria that are in association with these, these methane oxidizing archaea. And so using even just um, 16S ribosomal RNA tag sequencing, we were able to show for a single OTU how many other bacterial partners were they associated with. And from this, we were able to uh, learn that these guys are, are not exclusive in the partnerships that they form. So you can see a specific OTU for one methane oxidizing archaea forming different partnerships with different sulfate reducing bacterial groups. Um, the same is true for a specific bacterial group. They form different partnerships with, with archaea. So there's, there's that level of complexity in terms of the syntropic associations that you see uh, in situ. Now, since that time, we've been focused um, a lot more heavily on trying to understand from a genomic level what makes an anme an anme and how is it distinctive from other um, types of, of methanogens uh, in situ. And we've, um, like all single cell platforms, we had a, a variety of different um, levels of quality of genomes that we were able to recover, but in many cases, we were. Um, able to get pretty decent genome assemblies um, from these methane oxidizing um, consortia. And so everything that's colored here represents um, pretty good quality genome bins that we've been able to, to assemble um, from, from this effort. And because we were able to look at this from a single aggregate level, we were also interested in trying to understand what's hidden within this sort of um, innocuous name or subgroup of ANME 2A, right? So because we don't have culture representatives, we come up with these sort of um, placeholder names, and it's very easy to sort of get um, lost in um, the simplicity of a name when actually there's a lot more diversity hidden within each of these. And so um, we were able to focus now on the ANME 2A group. We have um, now 12 genomes to, to compare against this. And so uh, looking across this broad group, um, we see that the ANME 2A subclade represents at least multiple genera, if not um, higher order uh, family level distinctions um, within, within this clade. Now, if we look at the ones that were recovered all from the same incubation, they sort of represent this, this group here. And we were interested in trying to look more closely at the strain level variation. So is an aggregate sorted in one well the same as an aggregate sorted in the other? Or are, are each aggregate sort of its own little entity in and of itself? If we look at sort of the whole genome reconstruction, they all look like they're strains um, of each other. Uh, but looking a little more closely, um, at this, we wanted to, to try to unpack whether or not there was heterogeneity within uh, each of these consortia. And so looking at the level of, of sequence variation within each of these aggregates compared to the assembled uh, metagenome bin from the same sample, uh, what we found was that it does really indeed look like the, the ANV that all exist in one aggregate are clonal. So we see much lower levels of, of uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms within each individual aggregate relative to the assembled pan metagenome from, from the same environment. Maybe that's not so surprising uh, given what we know about these metagenome uh, reassemblies. What was surprising, however, was that if we look at the top bar here, so this is looking at the, the level of, of shared genes um, from these four good quality single aggregate genomes relative to the pan genome here. Um, this assembled genome was predicted to be about 95% complete based on um, the core uh, genes. And what we see is that it overall is, has a smaller 
genome size relative to what we see across these single aggregate genomes. Um, and there was about 410 genes that were common across all of these single aggregate sorts that were missing from the metagenome uh, assembly overall. So even though you have the potential to uh, incorporate multiple strains in your metagenome assembly, we seem to be missing um, a lot, a big fraction of, of the genome here. And so this, I think, is good, a good indication that having both this sort of single organism sorting and metagenome assemblies are, are really complementary to each other in trying to get a better holistic picture of what's going on uh, in situ. Now, looking also at these um, four individual sorted aggregates, uh, we also found evidence of a lot of um, genome rearrangements and insertions and, and deletions. And so, again, there's a lot hidden when we do even at, at the genome level of reassembling and looking at the phylogenetic distributions of these groups. Uh, and so, for instance, we have this fairly well-conserved area um, shown in green here flanked by a pretty um, variant uh, region ac uh, across uh, the genome where you have um, genes that are unique to some uh, specific variants and missing uh, in others. And so looking sort of at the, the predicted annotations, these are genes that look like they're involved in things that are excreted to the outside of the cell, might be involved in interspecies interaction or interactions with the environment. And so there may be a lot hidden in here that might help explain why we see so much diversity of these different groups sustained um, in situ. And so this will be an interesting area to, to explore further. Now another thing that we looked at was the potential for metabolic complementation or oxytrophies within these groups. And this is something that has emerged as a common phenomenon, especially in um, sort of uh, uh, simplified interdependent um, association. So be it whether or not you're looking at engineered E. coli strains or, or other types uh, of, of association. So this is a nice paper that was out of Carson Zengler's lab where they were looking at an anaerobic uh, hexadecane degrading uh, simplified community. And what they found was that there was a lot of um, sort of overlap in the types of methanogen capabilities that were um, supported in this longstanding uh, enrichment culture. And when they looked closely sort of at the, at the genome level and, and also looking at the level of transcripts, what they found was that there was a lot of complementation in terms of the amino acids that were produced. So many of the organisms lacked the capability of producing certain amino acids, so those are the ones that are sort of open squares here. Um, but that overall, the community itself had the capability of synthesizing every amino acid. And so we had this hypothesis it seemed like a reasonable thing to assume that the, in these long evolved methane oxidizing communities that have been living together for many, you know, millions of years likely, um, that they too should show some evidence of, of genome um, complementation in terms of their nutritional demands. And so we were um, quite disappointed um, to find out that in every single example of these methane oxidizing archaea, they seem to all have the genetic capability to synthesize every single amino acid. And so this was also true when we looked at the sulfate-reducing bacterial partners. So it doesn't appear, at least on a genome level, that they are experiencing any sort of shedding or, or genome erosion um, through this, this longstanding interaction, which is uh, a little surprising but, but also, I think, intriguing to, to think about further. So in the absence of, of looking at sort of nutritional interdependencies of these organisms, we are also interested in sort of the core energy, energetics of this association. So what makes this syntrophic interaction tick? And so we, um, there's a number of, of different hypotheses that have sort of been generated over time. Um, the first one of course is the one I introduced earlier that is um, sort of a classic form of syntrophy where you have a, a chemically diffusible intermediate like hydrogen that's being passed from the methane oxidizing archaea to its sulfate reducing partner. Another hypothesis that was uh, put forth a few years ago was that um, in this case the methane oxidizing 
archaea could actually reduce the sulfate directly to a disulfide intermediate. And then this disulfide was being disproportionated um, back to sulfide and sulfate by the sulfate-reducing bacterial partner. So this is a fundamentally different way of thinking about um, this association with uh, both redox reactions occurring uh, directly in the archaea itself. And then the final example or hypothesis out there is one where the methane oxidizing archaea is oxidizing methane to CO2, and those eight electron equivalents are being uh, conducted through an extracellular uh, conductive matrix to this sulfate-reducing partner through direct interspecies electron um, transfer. And so we've been um, thinking about these various hypotheses and, and how to, to try to deconvolve uh, this in our, our system. And, and so in addition to sort of applying these, these uh, geochemical and molecular uh, techniques, we also have had uh, the great fortune to be able to work with a variety of different modelers that have provided us with, with sort of a framework for, for testing um, these hypotheses. And so each one of those scenarios leads to different outcomes in terms of the spatial distribution of, of energy gained by each of the partners depending on how far apart they are. And so we can see this sort of in, in model space here. So if you have in a layered community where the archaea are a core shell and it's surrounded by sulfate reducing bacteria, the prediction is in the center those archaea that are far away from their nearest electron sink should not be active. And so you should see activity sort of in a, in a layer. Whereas if the cells are really well mixed together, we might see activity throughout the aggregate, right? And so we've been trying to, to come up with ways of looking at the activity on a single cell level um, directly uh, in the environment. And to do this, we applied um, the fluorescence situation with with nanosims, where we're using a 15N labeled um, nitrogen source that's commonly assimilated by both partners of these methane oxidizing archaea. And so the idea is that as the cells are making new biomass, they will incorporate this 15N signal, and then we can read it out using uh, the nanosims and get a sense of how active one cell is um, relative to the other, and sort of shown in these incubation strips. And so we did this for a variety of different aggregate types with different types of, of spatial um, arrangements. And what we found was that actually there wasn't a relationship between the two syntrophic partners in terms of their activity and um, the distance to their, their nearest syntroph. And so we see this both for looking at the archaeal activity versus the nearest um, bacteria, and then conversely, the bacteria archaea, uh, activity relative to its nearest archaea. So there's no sort of distance dependency in terms of the syntrophic association. Now we can compare this to the various scenarios. So again, in the case of a chemical uh, diffusion uh, situation with either hydrogen or, or acetate, the prediction is you should see the most activity sort of at, at a very sharp interface where the two partners are intersecting. And that uh, was definitely not what we were seeing in these incubations. Conversely, if we take this, this idea of disulfide disproportionation with a sulfate reducing uh, archaea, in this case, the prediction is the archaea sh should be active and independent of the distance to the sulfate reducing bacterial partner. But the sulfate reducing bacterial partner, because it's relying on this disulfide intermediate, does show a gradient in activity that's related to distance to its nearest sulfate reducing bacterial partner. And again, we don't see that across the data set. And this is an example of, of an aggregate here where the, the gray scale is showing levels of, of activity. So that didn't seem to be uh, good at explaining our data either. And then the third uh, model was one where we treated this as sort of a conductive matrix. And, and the, the model itself, you can think of it really like fast diffusion in this, in this system. And so the idea is that electrons um, can be shuttled uh, throughout this, um, this entire aggregate. And under those types of conditions, then we see that the spatial reliance on 
the two partners dissipates and that you can have organisms that are very far apart from each other that still maintain high levels of, of anabolic activity. And so we, we propose this as sort of a, one of the hypotheses that seem to best fit the data at the time. So looking at the genomes um, of these organisms, we also found evidence um, for this that supports this idea of extracellular electron transfer in the form of very large multi-heme cytochromes that seem to be exclusive to these methane oxidizing um, archaea. In fact, now that we've been able to sequence uh, a diversity of these different methane oxidizing archaeal groups, we can almost say that it's a hallmark of these organisms that helps distinguish it from other types of methanogens. And so this is showing you sort of the, a range of sequenced genomes that all have multi-heme cytochrome, uh, and then the highest, the largest size of that multi-heme cytochrome here. And the ones that are in orange arrows are the archaea, the ones in green are the sulfate reducing bacteria. So both partners seem to be producing or have the capacity to produce these large multi-heme uh, cytochromes that have been shown in other systems like Geobacter to be integral to extracellular electron transfer. So the other interesting thing is in, in looking at the genomes of the sulfate reducing partner, it appears not only do they have these large multi-heme um, cytochrome cassettes, but they appear to have been horizontally transferred around. So it's, it looks like something that is important to the association with their sulfate-reducing bacteria. So this is a genome um, tree here, and that's what's shown in sort of green and red are two different groups of sulfate reducers that form associations with these methane oxidizing archaea. And then here we see a, a phylogenetically coherent clade that represents these multi-heme cytochrome cassettes. So that there's a, a there's a incongruence uh, between what we see with the core genes and what we see uh, with these, these multi-heme cytochromes that look like they're being used exclusively in this association with these methane oxidizing archaea. Now, we also were interested in looking more on a histological level to see if we could find evidence that these things were being excreted to the extracellular matrix. And so we uh, did this in a couple of different ways. So one was, was using a stain known as diaminobenzidine or, or DAB. And basically in the presence of peroxide, it will um, catalyze the precipitation of a, an opaque substrate that can be seen with electron microscopy. And so what we see here with the DAB staining is all of this dark precipitate that's occurring in between uh, the cells relative to the control where we didn't add the hydrogen uh, peroxide. So this is consistent with these large multi-heme cytochromes um, sitting in that extracellular space between the cells. Now, more recently, because we can do these sort of uh, pulse chase experiments with, with 15 uh, N, we can actually track where those proteins in some cases are being localized um, in these organisms. And, and in some cases, what we see is that there is active um, protein excretion in the form of these 15N or, or 15N labeled um, substrate that's being put in the extracellular space uh, between the cells that's shown up here in the, the nanosims image as this lighter uh, region here. So there's a lot of dynamics that are going on outside of the cell that I think will, will be really um, very, very exciting to, to try to uh, study in more detail with advanced microscopy uh, techniques. Okay. So once we had an idea about the fact that the archaea could excrete electrons extracellularly, uh, the next question was whether or not we could actually decouple them from their syntrophic partner and were they reliant on sulfate overall, or did they just care about getting rid of electrons? And so uh, we set up a series of experiments um, to look to see if we could um, sort of recover methane oxidation activity uh, in the absence of sulf sulfate and an active sulfate-reducing bacterial partner, and also to sort of address this, this question of whether or not sulfate is, is really tied to the process through um, disproportionation uh, with a, a, a centrific partner. So the idea here is that we could set up 
incubations in the lab where we could chemically manipulate the culture, still provide them with methane as a substrate, take away sulfate. This should basically um, uh, make the, the partner inactive. And if we could provide them with basically a sink for those electrons at the right midpoint potential. And so in this case, we, were, we tried a variety of different substrates, um, AQDS, which is sort of a, a, an analog for humic substances, um, ferric iron, that sort of thing. And so we ran these experiments um, over time, and what we found was that um, we were able to capture a level of methane oxidation that was similar to when sulfate was in, in the bottle. So these organisms basically were still oxidizing methane at a rate um, that was equivalent to an active sulfate reducing uh, centrophic association, uh, but in this case, there is no sulfate um, present in the bottle. And so we wanted to look to see whether or not the, the archaea and the sulfate-reducing bacteria were active. And so we did these same kinds of experiments where we added the 15N label and asked, do we see evidence of activity between the partners? And so this is showing you in SIMS space um, all of the, the biomass in the 15N, 14N, uh, or sorry, the 14N image. And then if we look at the 15N, 14N ratio, what we see here is that only the archaea are active, the cells that are shown in red. So the sulfate-reducing bacteria were shut off. We're seeing evidence of methane um, oxidation. So this was very, made us happy. We thought, okay, we can separate the, the partnership. Great. And so um, with this, we were thinking we had this wonderful platform now. We can start manipulating this uh, un previously untractable association and start asking questions about what makes um, the sulfate-reducing partner versus the archaea um, tick under different types of, of conditions, and possibly maybe we could actually even get these methane oxidizing archaea in pure culture now that we can get rid of, of this centrophic partner. And so we set up a series of experiments now to sort of look at um, the association under these different um, conditions and through the lens of using um, metatranscriptomics. And so we did this work in co uh, collaboration with uh, Gene Tyson and his group at the University of Queensland, uh, and we set up a series of short-term incubations um, with various types of controls where either we didn't supply them with uh, uh, methane but only the electron acceptor. Here we have only methane and no electron acceptor, and then we have um, various forms of either just AQDS, AQDS with sulfate, or uh, methane and sulfate. And so we see under these conditions there's active methane oxidation uh, occurring in, the, uh, in terms of C13 uh, production. And then we collected a time course uh, in triplicate basically looking at uh, the transcriptional response under these different conditions to see if we could learn about these associations. So this is sort of ongoing work here. I'm only going to um, show you a little bit of data today. Um, but in support of this, this idea that the sulfate-reducing bacterial um, groups were shut down in the presence of um, AQDS, we see that also on a transcriptional level here. So this is just showing you the DSRA. This is with methane and sulfate. Um, these two are with AQDS, either with and without sulfate, and then this is methane only. And so we do a pretty good job of basically shutting off um, the sulfate-reducing partner. We see this across um, all of the, the key energetic genes involved in sulfate reduction. If we compare that to what we see on the archaea side, uh, we find that there is expression um, across all of the main um, uh, genes in the, in the methanogenic and or methanotrophic pathway um, under conditions with sulfate and also with, with AQDS, and then again at the end is no electron acceptor. And so, Again, from a transcriptional response, this supports our nanosense data in terms of um, the activity levels. Now, because we um, also had these sorted aggregate genomes to go along with the transcripts, we can start to ask questions about how different strains are expressing um, genes in, in situ and look at some of the broad level differences between these major groups like the ANV2A and the ANV2C. 
And again, so we're, we're just starting to dig into this, this data now, um, but a little surprising. We see with the NB2A, this is just looking at the methyl coenzyme M reductase um, alpha subunit here. Again, with the NB2A, we see um, transcriptional response under um, sulfate and the AQDS and very little under methane. However, with the NB2C, we see activity throughout, but, but uh, even higher level of response with methane only and no, um, no electron acceptor. So this was a little bit of a, a head scratcher, and we're not really sure uh, what this translates into in terms of the function um, in the environment. And so we were interested, we're gonna come back to this in a second, but um, it, it's an interesting uh, phenomenon in terms of how we interpret this data. Now we're also interested then in these multi-heme cytochromes that are found in the extracellular space. And so if we look now at their expression levels, again, we see if we don't give them an electron acceptor, we don't see very um, high levels of expression of these things. And so what we're looking at is each colored dot represents one of the different NB2A strains. And so not only do we see that these multi-heme cytochromes are expressed, but that depending on which strain you're looking at, they have different levels of expression um, in, in the bottle. And so I think this will be a very powerful approach to be able to start to look at potential strain level differences um, in the context of, of a community uh, living in situ. Okay, so I mentioned we were a little bit surprised by this um, ANMI2C data and the fact that we are seeing expression um, in the methane-only control. And this was um, especially um, uh, interesting in the context of our um, NanoSIMS data where we showed that both ANMI2A and ANMI2C consortia didn't show any evidence of 15N uptake. So they didn't look like they were making any new proteins in the course of that incubation. And so one possibility that we should think about as a, as a community is with these very slow growing communities, we don't really have a good handle on what happens um, with, the trans, with transcripts. Like what is the longevity of transcripts in the environment? Um, what is you know, their, their ability to regulate under different conditions? So, um, so I think uh, there's a lot to be unpacked in looking at these sort of non-conventional, non-fast-growing, aerobic, heterotrophic E. coli's of the world and, and thinking about how, how they're regulating uh, their, their, um, their transcriptome uh, in situ and how long these transcripts stick around um, in these various environmental contexts. Okay, so I'm just gonna end with a little bit of a, a teaser data. So we're very interested in trying to understand the role of sulfur in this system, especially in the context of the fact that we can grow them now with AQDS. And one thing I, I, I didn't mention, um, so we've been trying to, to get these organisms in pure culture, and, and one of the things that has been incredibly frustrating is that they will do well for a while, and then over time they start to peter out. So we are clearly missing something um, in, in these incubations. And it turns out that these organisms really do like sulfate but they don't like sulfate as an electron do, um, acceptor. They like sulfate as a sulfur source for assimilation. And so we found that we could stimulate growth even by adding just a small amount, 50 micromolar of sulfate, um, that this was enough to sort of boost their metabolism. And so we've been interested now in, in using sort of other chemical imaging techniques to learn about what, what forms of sulfur uh, are found in these, these aggregates under different types of conditions. And so to, to sort of compare here, this is a sulfur ion image that's taken with the nanosim. So we see really good um, spatial resolution of the individual cells. Uh, and we can couple this with isotopically labeled sulfur sources. Um, this is looking at X-ray fluorescence here. In this case, it's a much lower resolution technique. So each pixel represents a five by five micron um, square, but what we're looking at here is, is an aggregate. And so if we do the near K-edge analysis, we can get information about um, different reduced and oxidized forms of sulfur um, in the cells. And so this is a collaboration we've been doing um, with Sam Webb 
so we can look at things like the, the pools of methionine, sulfate esters, um, sulfur. We can even see the AQDS um, in these, these incubations. And so what we do see initially is that these different incubations, either without sulfate or with AQDS uh, or no electron acceptor, uh, they do show different spectra. So the, those sulfur pools are changing uh, in these organisms under these different conditions. And so we're, we're excited to look at this a little bit more closely. Okay. So with that, I want to um, sort of come back to this big question again of, of how do we link organisms in the environment to their various processes um, and, and have a better handle on what's happening in terms of the bio biochemical cycle of carbon, uh, nitrogen, sulfur uh, in, in situ. And so um, in order to do this, we really need a variety of, of different types of techniques. So I hope I've, I've given you some examples of how we've applied this to the study of anaerobic methane oxidation. Uh, but there really isn't like one single formula that works for all ecosystems, but rather it's, it's going to be sort of this, this multidisciplinary approach that's really going to give us insight into what's going on um, in various uh, ecosystems. And so um, really I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful and excited about this time in the technological advancements that have allowed us not only to, to sort of query across these various scales, but actually to start to, to bridge between the different scales in terms of the levels of information that we're gaining. And really, it's this, this combination that's going to be um, necessary for really trying to better understand how these ecosystems uh, are working, and even more importantly, um, in thinking about forecasting, modeling um, how these ecosystems are going to respond um, to potential changes in the future. And so the challenge, I think, for us going forward is at what level of granularity do we need to really understand these ecosystems in order to make these kinds of, of more robust uh, predictions on what's going on. And I think there's many people in the room that have sort of contributed to this, this process, and I, I'm excited to be here with you, and I'm happy to talk with you more um, tonight and, and tomorrow. And so with that, I'd like to just thank my group, um, folks in the Orphan Lab currently and in the past, um, in particular Connor, uh, Skinnerton, who's been doing a lot of the metagenomic works, Hank Yu, who has, uh, was integral in the um, AQDS experiments and the transcriptomic work, Gray Chadwick, who's done a lot of the nanosims imaging uh, and various other things in the lab, John Magyar, that's been doing the work on the synchrotron, uh, Sean McGlynn, Sylvan Scheller, and Roland Hattenpickler, all um, former postdocs in the group that have now moved on, have their own labs, and are doing wonderful things. Um, a variety of different folks um, down in San Diego at NICMER who've helped with some of the imaging, uh, the modeling team led by Christoph Melli and uh, Chris Kempis uh, at UGA and SFI. Of course, the wonderful people um, at the JGI, Tanya and Rex and Danielle, uh, who have just really made this project um, fly. Uh, and of course, my long-term colleague, um, Gene Tyson and his group and of course, funding support from uh, DOE and the Moore and Ficus. So thank you very much. <laughs>